Hi, my name is Patrick Grant, and I want to talk to you about my Faraday Institution project, Nextrobe, which is all about making better electrodes for lithium-ion batteries. So let me first describe how lithium-ion batteries are made at the moment. In the image on the top right-hand side of your screen, you can see a commercial manufacturing line for the anode and the cathode, which go into a lithium-ion battery. Uh, this uh, involves slurry casting of particulates onto a foil. You can see that in the picture below. You can see a copper foil with three black stripes. The black stripes are the graphite, which is going into the anode of a lithium ion battery. Um, the process can run at something like 90 meters per minute. So it's, it's a very fast and productive process. Those anodes, which you see being made there, are somewhere between 50 and 100 microns thick. In the picture below on the bottom right hand side, you can then see a cross section of a lithium ion battery. So you can see the orangey color, that's the copper foil, and it's been coated on both sides with the graphite containing slurry. The lighter lines are aluminium foil in cross section, which are being coated on either side with the cathode material. And then the anode and the cathode wound together, separated by a thin polymer separator, you might just be able to make out there to make sure that the anode and the cathode never touch. And it's this process which produces over 5 billion cells per year and rapidly increasing. If we zoom in a little bit more and look at the structure in more detail, that's in the, in the last picture in the set in the bottom left-hand corner, um, taken in, in, in my laboratory, you can see the, the larger and uh, nearly spherical particles, they're the active materials, they're the materials which are doing the uh, lithium ion storage they're held in place by the lighter material, which is the binder, a sticky polymer. And within the binder, there are small particles of carbon, which uh, percolate the electrons through the structure so the battery can be charged and discharged. And the anode and the cathode structure are quite similar, both made by this slurry casting process. However, to my mind, the structure, although we know lithium batteries work well and it's a productive process, is a little bit chaotic. What I'm going to show you later is the benefits that we can achieve in battery performance if we take more care or we use processes that give us greater control over that microstructure. So the aims of the project are to understand how that structure evolves and to work out how we can control it better to get structures which give us better battery performance. To, and this will allow us to put more design into the battery rather than trial and error optimization in the way we form those structures at the moment. And we're also investigating a new generation of processes to invent new processes that give us a step change in control of the structure of electrodes and allow us to better realize the intrinsic performance of the energy storage materials. So in the bottom left-hand corner, you see the bar graph, which is about the production capacity, the so-called gigafactory capacity for making lithium-ion batteries. I don't need to go through the numbers, but you can immediately see that this is uh, a process which is being uh, scaled up and, and, and invested in a very large scale, primarily to fuel the growth of the EV uh, market. So why improve this well-established process, which, which is not broken, but we believe can offer, uh, has, we, need, we can create headroom to create a better process and a better battery. Well, one of the first drivers is cost. Uh, although cost has come down by about nearly a factor of 10 over the last 10 or 15 years, it needs to halve again. It needs to get much closer or beyond or lower than $100 per kilowatt hour. As far as the electrode is concerned, most of that cost is in the material, particularly in the cathode, but up to a third can be in the manufacturing cost. And what's critical to controlling that cost is the manufacturing yield, how efficient your plant is, how fast it is, how reliable it is, and how quickly you can reconfigure it to make other types of materials. So there is a cost driver, but there's also a performance driver. Uh, we need to be able to store more energy in a fixed volume, for example, the space available within an electric vehicle platform. A simple way to do that would be just to make the electrodes thicker and minimize the amount of the copper and the aluminum foil you saw on the earlier slide. But if we do that, we make thicker electrodes, they're actually more difficult to dry and to calendar, roll them to the right thickness, but also they become sluggish. 
and they don't deliver the right amount of power. The schematic shows the basic steps of the, of the slurry casting process. We mix the active material, the carbon and the binder together. We coat them to form the electrode. The electrode is formed into, into a battery and into cells integrated into the electric vehicle platform. And of course, we must be mindful of how we get it out with out and what we do with it after the end of life. So from a manufacturing point of view, not necessarily a performance point of view, we need frugal manufacturing, we need efficiency, we need high yield, low waste, we need to optimize quickly. So when we change from one battery material to another, we can get the line up and running quickly. It doesn't take the current one, two, or even three months that it can take at the moment. And then we can start to extract the better performance, the more intrinsic properties of the battery materials, and eventually achieve new balances, for example, of lifetime, power, and energy through a smarter electrode enabled by new manufacturing technologies. So what are the barriers to this kind of approach? Well, the principal barrier is that this is a well-established process uh, that is very productive. But it is based on trial and error largely. And our objective is to put the science into this process to make it more efficient, flexible, and reconfigurable, uh, and to achieve better performance. We have to do that on a credible scale. Uh, there's been lots of work done at the laboratory scale, but something that's baked into our project from the beginning is the ability to scale from laboratory insights to the intermediate scale and ultimately to the production scale. And it's really only at the larger scale where we, if we can quantify the benefits of our approach, will we reduce the barriers to commercialization. So a little bit more detail on our methodology here. So the first thing we're doing right now is setting our baseline. We're using industry materials, industry standard practices to establish a credible and detailed set of data for what is the current state of the art in lithium ion batteries and how are they made. From that baseline, we can then quantify any uh, improvements that we might, might make. For example, by making the particles easier to handle as we form them into the electrode, by looking at the dynamics of the way the particles move, the binder moves, how adhesion is formed, how drying can be manipulated and calendaring, by bringing forward new processes such as layer by layer, deposition and templating of the pores to give us much more microstructural control. And then bringing that forward into the design part in work, work package four. So to have a model led optimization and design-led approach to what should an electrode look like in order to realize the properties of the materials more effectively. And then the project is, is held together uh, by our data strategy, if you like a digital twin, where we're recording all the manufacturing and performance data at all scales of manufacture and using machine learning approaches to understand how process parameters need to be changed in order to scale quickly from the laboratory to the production line. And that's with our industrial partners, which you can see listed on the right hand side there. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Smith and I'm from the University of Sheffield. Today I'll be speaking to you a little bit about some of the work we're doing in Nextrobe and in particular some of the work we're doing in Web Package 1. So in Web Package 1, we're applying a technique called discrete element method, also known as DEM. And DEM is a method of simulating manufacturing processes uh, which are used to form particular products, much like electrodes. It's widely used across a lot of different industries, including pharmaceuticals, uh, foods, agrochemicals, and um, minerals processing, and, and many others. Um, and it has opportunities to be applied right throughout the entire uh, electrode manufacturing process, including the mixing process, creating films, and calendaring. So some of the work that we've started um, doing is looking very simply at creating structures uh, of electrodes within uh, DEM. So, you can see at the bottom of the screen here, there are three different methods that we have started to use. The first is called the particle packing algorithm. And this is basically a uh, system where we create an algorithm to give us a closely packed uh, structure. Um, you can see that it's quite dense and you can see that, it's, that it's, uh, you, there's a distributed uh, packing of multiple sizes of different particles in this structure. Another system that we've been using is called the plate compression method. In this method, we generate lots of different particles 
um, and then over time we compress them down. We can compress them to uh, our density and porosity of our, of our choosing, but you can see that generally we're, we're creating quite dense structures again. So both of these two structures you could imagine as being pre-compressed or pre-calendared uh, electrodes. One thing that's really exciting is the work that we're doing on the right, which is taking um, tomographic data and actually reconstructing that structure in DEM. Once we've done that, we can then place it into particle bonds between the particles in DEM. And as you can imagine, these interparticle bonds are actually the carbon binder domain. So you can see that there's an excellent opportunity here to overlay electrochemical models on top of the structural models that we're generating uh, to help us link the structure with the performance of the electrodes. And this is work that we're really excited about doing uh, in conjunction with Paul Shearing's group at UCL. So I've given you a little overview of some of the work that we're doing. Um, and it's been very nice. Thank you very much. So I just want to give one technical deep dive about the sort of thing we're doing and the benefits that it might produce. So in the top left hand corner, you can see a schematic idealized picture of a graded electrode where the carbon green uh, is rich at the bottom next to the current collector and the active material purple is more concentrated at the top. In a conventional slurry cast electrode, uh, the purple and the green would be randomly mixed together. So we hypothesize that this graded structure might produce some benefits. So below that in the picture lab labeled actual is a graded electrode we've realized in practice using one of the processes we've invented. And you can see there is a, a gradation in the, in the structure there. And I've made that a little clearer to see just by false coloring the carbon green and the active material purple according to the schematic at, at the top. So if we now take our new graded electrode and compare it to a conventional slurry cast electrode, same materials, same amount of materials, same thickness electrodes, you can see that at 3C, which means three charges and discharges per hour, we've more than doubled the capacity that's realizable from this cathode, a lithium iron phosphate cathode in this case, and we've about half the resistance. So the next question in the, in the picture in the middle on the bottom is why does this happen? Why are these graded electrodes better? And in order to, to unpick that, we've constructed a model of how electrodes work. And on this plot, on the y-axis, we have impedance. Let's think of that as the resistance of the battery, which we want to be as low as possible. And we can see from the green and the black line, they're the conventional, what we call uniform, randomly mixed materials and all the graded structures, uh, which we've also modeled and, and made in practice are shown to be uh, better performing with lower resistance. So having now a flexible model, which can incorporate microstructure, we can use that model to invert and say, what is the best structure? So for finally on the right-hand side there, you can see where we've used the model, this, in this case for a uh, flat, pouch cell to say, what is the optimum distribution of active materials in that pouch cell to give us the best performance? And what it shows is there's no point putting lots of active material in the corners, they're dead zones. And what, what in order to get the best performance from what you do put there, you should put more carbon in the corners. Um, and what we're now doing is working out how do we make this structure in practice? And we've got some ideas for that. Uh, and then we will see whether our model is true or not. And this will then provide us with a very flexible uh, resource to design optimum layouts of materials in electrodes through thickness and in plane. So where are we hoping to get to? We're hoping to build off our baseline a whole series of performance improvements. These are not just battery improvements, but they're manufacturing improvements too. And the two go hand in hand. So for example, smart particles might lead to optimized handling, which will improve some measure of performance. Deposition control makes, may allow us to make thicker electrodes that don't compromise our power. Our new processes, our smarter manufacturing will allow us to optimize materials to recover any power density and get, get benefits there. And then this design intent, which is then rather than a trial and error, is saying for any given set of performance requirements and materials, what is the best way to arrange them in the electrode? And then using our digital twin or digital spine that runs through the project is learning how to scale those insights up to the production scale. We will produce new know-how 
intellectual property that we will protect and a pipeline of trained people for the UK battery industry. Here is the, the next road team. Uh, we are almost at full strength. Uh, we are pleased that we have a, uh, a team which I think represents diverse views and people at different career stages, representative of society as a whole, which is something we believe will make it a, a better project to be on and a more impactful project. So let me summarize where we've got to. Uh, we want to understand existing lithium-ion battery manufacturing technology better so that we can create headroom in that process to extract the uh, intrinsic value of energy storage materials more effectively. We also want to invent a new family of manufacturing processes, which will give us extra control over the structure and performance. We have a consortium uh, designed to try to overcome some of the barriers to uh, adopting new manufacturing processes, uh, including industry support and industry validation of what we've done. Uh, we've brought together people with a diverse group of experience uh, and at different stages to try to make sure we have a variety of perspectives and create a really innovative environment for our, our research. And the whole project is linked together with a lab to line philosophy, which is that we really want the things that we do in the laboratory to find their ways uh, to industry quickly and as efficiently as possible. So thanks very much for listening and uh, I'll try to answer any questions. Thank you.